Let's give God some praise. Let's just start off just worshiping him, even just for us making it here today, amen? We are so excited because he deserves all of our worship this morning. So today we have some special guests coming in today to teach. There's going to be an awesome time of fellowship. But let's first start off fellowshipping with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today, amen? God, we give you all the glory, all the honor this morning because you deserve it. God, help us to fixate our thoughts, our hearts, our minds, everything on you today, Jesus. Hallelujah. We can stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. And give him some praise and worship today. Here we go. I will worship with all of my heart. I will praise you with all of my strength. I want you guys to clap your hands and sing along to the words. Here we go. I will bow down and hail you as king. I will serve you. Trust you. I'll trust you alone. And I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. Guys, excited to be in the house of God today? All right, so this next part, the whole song is call and response, okay? But I want you guys to repeat after me. I want you to say, worthy of praise. Say nice and loud, worthy of praise. There we go, worthy of glory. Worthy of honor. Worthy of my praise. Let's all sing that together. Worthy of praise. Worthy of, praise. Worthy of glory. Worthy of Worthy of honor, worthy of, worthy of praise. You're worthy of glory and worthy of honor. Worthy of, worthy of praise. Worthy of glory. You're worthy of honor. Worthy of, worthy of praise. You're worthy of glory. And worthy of honor, worthy of my praise. And I will give you all my worship. And I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. And you alone are worthy. One more time. Give a 
shout to, shout to God right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, right now, during this time of worship, we give ourselves away to you, God. God, we don't want to hold anything back this morning. Help us to open our minds, open our hearts, and be open to you right now, Jesus. Church, if you want to give yourself away to God fully, let's sing it all together. I give myself away. Give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. That's one voice. Sing it again. I give myself away. So you can use me, I give myself away, I give myself away, so you can use me, here I am, here I stand, Lord. sing together. My life is not my own. If you belong to him, lift your hands high. Sing it out to him. I give 
change.
before your presence came and changed me. All together. I won't go back. I can't go back to the way you used to be before your presence came and changed me. I won't go back. I can't go back to the way you used to be before your presence came. Hallelujah. Lord, your saints cry out to you this morning. Give them a hand clap of praise. Don't be ashamed of your worship to God. God, we glorify your name this morning. We give you all the glory, all the adoration today, Jesus. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. God, we love you. We worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Impact. Let me try that again. Good morning, Impact. Yeah, that's the way I like to hear it. Amen. You know, God is good to us each and every day when he allows us to wake up in the morning. So we need to be grateful every time we open our eyes in the morning that God is so gracious that he smiled on us enough to know that we are still needed here. We still have purpose here on earth. Amen? Amen. At this time, we want to move into our uh, announcement period, and we'd like to welcome all of our guests. We have two special guests here today, uh, Steve and Donna, who are missionaries. Uh, so right now, we if you are a new guest or if you're new online, please let us know so that we can get a gift to you and welcome you aboard. And hopefully you'll become a member of the Impact family because we, we can impact more. The more people that get involved, the more we can make an impact in this world. Amen? Amen. So at this time, it's giving time. All right, here we go again. Let me, let, y'all act like y'all excited. Giving time is a good time. That's when we give the Lord back because he already gave us up front. God gives us 100% and say, give me 10% back. If somebody gave me $100 and, and I asked them, well, can you give me $10 back? I'm quite sure they won't have a problem with it. I know I wouldn't. Amen? So let me try that again. It's giving time. Y'all need to be excited when it's giving time. Because the, the word says that the Lord loves a what? A cheerful giver. All right? So here are the ways we can give. If you're here in the audience, you can fill out an envelope and place it in our treasure box. For those who are not here, you can mail in an envelope to Impact Church at P.O. Box 155, Maywood, Illinois, 60153. For those who are donating online, just go to impact-church-maywood.org. Amen? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't put that in there yet. I want y'all to raise your offerings, amen? And we're going to give it to the Lord, amen? Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each and every individual who has the ability to give, Father God, and we ask that you give those who do not have the ability to give the ability to give, Father God. We ask that you open up doors for them and allow income to flow in father god and not just flow in let it overflow father god so that they can be more and more givers father god because we know that you love a cheerful giver and that the more we give the more we receive and the more we bless your kingdom the more we can put meat in your house so that you can feed those who need to be fed father god either with your word or physically with food father god we just thank you right now in the mighty name of jesus for each and every individual that has to give, Father God, and we thank you for those that do not have to give but are willing to give what they have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Yes. Amen. So at this time, we're going to move into a, vi a video. Amen. Amen. So today we're blessed to have two guest speakers. Our pastor is not here, but he welcomes you and hope that you'll treat this as if it were your own home. Amen. And right now I want to bring up our guests. Their names are Steve and Donna Krustulovich. Did I say that right? All right. Thank you so much, Pastor Bass. You said it better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to be with you all this morning. Yes. We greet you today. I'm going to take this off. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. We greet you today in the powerful, wonderful, exalted name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy. Amen? Amen. 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 And we're Steve and Donna. I'm Steve. I'm Donna. <laughs> and we just want to say how we are so blessed to be here this morning. We're grateful for Pastor Anthony's invitation. And we just want to thank all of the pastoral staff and um, everyone here today. And we are just very blessed to be with you. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, let's just have a word of prayer again as we open. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in the house of the Lord today. We thank you because when we come into your presence, we are changed. And Lord, we invite you today, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come, to move among us, to speak to us, to encourage our hearts, to help us lift our eyes to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we ask, Almighty God, that you would just be present and we thank you in Jesus' name. Help us not to leave the same as when we entered in, because we will have been in the presence of the Most High God. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, we're missionaries, but it's so great to be at Impact Church because this is a missionary church. Amen. That's what impact means, right? <laughs> Go out and impact the neighborhood. So we're all doing the same things, brothers and sisters. What an honor it is to be here. We'd like to share just a little bit about the ministry that we're involved in. It's called Global Initiative and Global Initiative Reaching Muslim Peoples. And um, we have some slides that we Let's see if that. No, we don't. Okay. okay. No problem. No problem. We will speak without them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Global Initiative Reaching Muslim Peoples was started as a prayer movement. There was a missionary who served in Africa who was looking out over all of the Muslims who were praying, and he just thought, 
Lord Jesus, how are we ever going to make an impact on the Muslim world? How are we going to reach all of these Muslims? Do you know that there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world today? That is one in every four people on the planet is a Muslim. And Muslims are people that Jesus loves and died for. And so we really believe that every Muslim needs to know the truth about Jesus. And this missionary, as he was praying and asking God what to do, the Lord dropped a vision in his heart to begin to ask Christians to gather together and pray every Friday. Friday is the Muslim holy day when they go into the mosques to pray. And this man began to gather Christians, and now we have over 60,000 intercessors all over the world meeting every single Friday while the Muslims are in the mosque to pray that they would meet Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that was just the beginning of what's called the Juma Prayer Fellowship. That was the beginning, but now God has has um, increased this ministry to do many other types of things. So Steve and I are international trainers, and we travel all over to different places where we're invited to help equip the national churches in all of these lands to reach out to Muslim people. And um, it's a great blessing to be able to share the gospel, the good news, the only message that can transform our hearts and we get to share that with Muslim people. I don't know if you know this, but one in every four people on the planet is a Muslim. Isn't that incredible? That's almost two billion people. Now in the Assemblies of God, we don't even have 3,000 missionaries. So how are we gonna reach two billion people? Well, think about it. Wouldn't it really be nice if we were able to help Christians in these countries around the world, even here, who already know the language and already know the culture, to reach out to their neighbors with the gospel. Now that might work, don't you think? Well, that's what we're doing. So we, we, we do missions in that particular way. We've done missions in the conventional way, and this is, this is the same thing, but it's a group that does this in, in the uh, working with the church itself. And you know, the amazing thing is, Islam has been around for 1,400 years. It's not as old as Christianity. It's about 600 years after Christianity when it began. But in all those 1,400 years, there have not been as many Christians, if you added up, all, I mean, as many Muslims, if you added up all of them that ever turned to Christ, as there have been in just the last few years. Is that amazing? God is doing something, and that's what we do. Donna, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the ways that Muslims come to Christ? You know, the, the, way, the, the primary way that Muslims come to Christ are through the, it's through the love of a Christian friend. That's where all of us come in. How many of you have a Muslim friend? Wow, everyone, <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, you are a key to their meeting Jesus because as they see your life, as you share their faith, as you pray for them, then they can have a revelation and a relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's the first primary way. The second way is scripture in their own language. And I'd like to just share a, a brief story. Steve and I were living in Chicago at the time. Yeah, I'm and from here. Yes. <laughs> I'm from here. She's not. <laughs> I'm a foreigner, but Steve is actually from Chicago. So um, we, I had bought this box of, of Bibles, of um, New Testaments in Arabic. And I just asked the Holy Spirit to show me who to give these New Testaments to. And so one day there was a lady passing by our driveway, and she was going kind of down the hill a little bit, and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, give her a Bible. So I grabbed one of those New Testaments, and I went, and I was walking beside her. As she was going down the hill a little bit, she had her little girl with her, little, maybe, I don't know, four or five years old, I'm not sure. And then she had this little baby in the carriage, and they were walking. And so as they were walking down, I heard her speaking Arabic to her little girl. And I went up to her, and I said, oh, you speak Arabic? And she said, yes, I do. And I said, well, I'd like to give you a gift. This is a New Testament 
Injil in Arabic, and um, I'd like to give this to you. And she said, oh, well, I can't read that. And I said, you can't? And she said, no, I can't read that. And I said, but I thought you read Arabic. And she said, I do, but I can't read that. And I said, oh, why not? And she said, because it's been changed. And I said, it has? When? And she hit my shoulder and she said, I don't know. And immediately, it's like the ice just broke, just like that. And so we just continued to walk. And her little girl looked up at me and she said, do you like ice cream? And I said, I love ice cream. She said, Mommy, can she come to our house and have ice cream? You know how we are, ladies. She she looked down at her little girl and said, don't ask her now. I haven't cleaned the house. (laughs) And so, but the little girl was insistent. Please, Mommy, can she come for ice cream? So we just began to walk. I walked together with them, and we walked to their home. She opened up the apartment and said, okay, go and sit with my daughter, and, you know, I'll get the ice cream. And so she took all of her um, her, uh, hijab and everything off, and we went into her house, and we get a chance to just sit and talk for like two hours. And we had a lot in common just as women, and then we got to share. She shared her beliefs. I shared about the Bible. And so it was just a really wonderful time of fellowship. And you know, Muslims are very hospitable people. They invite invite people in and they want people to come in and share food. So it's a wonderful opportunity through hospitality as well. What's another way? Miracles, miracles. Do you know there, Jesus, we're not doing this work alone, all of us. Jesus is reaching Muslims even as they sleep. We had a friend who was, uh, you've heard about all these uh, refugees who were coming over in boats to Greece and places like that. And one of our friends was there on the border greeting them. And, and one of the refugees came up to him and he says, do you know an evangelical Christian? He says, well, yeah, why? He says, well, I've been having this prayer about a man in white who's sitting at a table eating, and he's inviting me to come eat with him. And he said, last night I had that prayer. Yeah. That dream, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he says, and he told me, find an evangelical Christian. So our friend said, well, I'm an evangelical Christian. And right away he got to share it. Do you know, of those refugees, more than 20,000 have come to Jesus. They have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. God is doing something incredible. It's not us. We don't have to be clever. All we have to do is let God use us. Let him use our tongue. Let him use our heart to share with these, these lovely people. You know, Islam is the religion, and that's one thing, but Muslims are wonderful people who are just under that religion. And Jesus died for every one of us, didn't he? So we need to help our Muslim neighbors and reach them. What's another way, Don? Another way is answers to prayer. You know, as we meet with our Muslim friends and they express a need or something that in their families or their own lives, we can ask them if we can pray for them and pray for them in the name of Jesus. And um, it's just wonderful how the Lord answers prayer. And it just shows them that God is a God who hears and who answers and he cares for them. I had an experience one time when I was living in South Asia. Um, I was there for 13 years. And um, so I was with my friend and um, as we, we had come back from shopping and the gate was wide open and she got really scared because she thought, oh no, something's happened to my father. And so I lived downstairs around the back and she lived at the ground floor. And so she went into her house, she just ran in and I thought, I don't know what I should do. So I went back into my house and I just called and I said, could I come up and pray for your father or should I pray here? And she said, no, just pray there. And he, she said, his fever is really high. And so I just began to pray and intercede. And we have a God who answers prayer, don't we? And as we, be, as we began to pray, that her father's fever broke. And later she called and she said, my father's fever is broken and he's doing well. And she was able to attribute that to prayer in the name of Jesus. So we need to be bold and pray for our Muslim friends in the precious holy name of Jesus. What's another way? Well, a fifth way is disillusionment with Islam. 
You know, we see things, don't we, on the news, and, and we hear about things with Islam, and we just shake our heads and go, oh my goodness, how is that possible? But you know, Muslims do the same thing. Many of them look at that and they say, I never knew this is what Islam was about. And you know, it's helping them to come to Christ because they see, you know, I was talking to Pastor Bass, and I love Pastor Bass. He has such a, a heart for people and to share the gospel. And he said, he was talking about it. He says, yeah, I have Muslim friends. I meet them all over here. There's Muslims around here. Uh, there's watchtower people. There's all kind of people here. Well, what do they all have? They all have a version of Jesus, don't they? I mean, Muslims have Isa, but it's not our Jesus, is it? And the watchtower has their Jesus, but he's not God, is he? So what is he? Yes, we know the real Jesus, don't we? And that's what draw every one of us, wasn't it? That's what brought us, because we can have a living relationship with the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How beautiful. We want to share with you on the table, there are all kind of free resources. Take everything. Please don't make us take this back. <laughs> it's heavy. <laughs> These three books are really good. You take each one of each. One is what Christians need to know about Muslims questions Muslims ask. Well, in other words, you want to scratch where they're itching, right? <laughs> Not answer questions they don't care about. And sharing your faith with Muslims. It's really pretty simple. And there's even a little track here called Why I Love Muslims and Why I'm a Follower of Jesus the Messiah. And this was a talk that was given in a mosque. And you can actually give this to a Muslim friend. And it beautifully explains who Jesus is and why you or a Christian. So all of this is there. Don't just take one. Take one of each. You're welcome to it all. We, we would love to have you take these and, uh, and to be a blessing to your neighbors. We'd like to share just a little bit about our background and how we got into this in the first place. Um, I was actually born overseas. I was born in the country of Iran. My parents were working there at the time, and um, then we ended up uh, living overseas most of my life growing up. We were in the, in the Philippines and Nepal and Pakistan and Malaysia, and, um, but we were Christmas and Easter type Christians. Any one of you been a Christian, Christmas and Easter type Christian before? You come through the doors on Christmas and Easter, and that's it. The rest of the time, you're not there. And um, so um, I grew up knowing that there was a God, but not really having a relationship with him. But my, a turning point came for me when, I, when my father died from a heart attack at the age of 52, a very sudden heart attack. And, um, and I, I was 21 at the time. And when I saw my dad dead on the emergency room table, I knew that whatever made him my father was not there anymore. And I was on a spiritual journey going in all the wrong directions. I was studying uh, New Age type of things. I had studied Hinduism and Buddhism and was into um, reincarnation and all those things. And as I looked at my father, I thought, you know, if, I'm, if he's reincarnated as one thing and I'm reincarnated as something else, how am I going to find him in the next life? And that started me on a search that lasted for about a year of intense searching, and I ended up at a place that was a center for the occult and was studying all of this natural healing through eating raw foods. I was into all of these meditations. But you know, I was hungry. I wanted to know the truth. I wanted to know how am I going to know my dad in the next life? How am I going to know? And so as I was studying all these things, I was at this institute, and a man came into the institute, and he said he could teach us to meditate better. And I thought, wow, that would be great. I was into all these meditations, and I thought that this was, you know, there's power associated with that. And I thought, wow, because there's so much power, I must be getting closer to the truth. But how many of us have found out that power and truth are not the same thing? Power and truth are not the same. But as this man came into the institute and said, I'll teach you to meditate better, I went to him after the lecture, and I said, I want to learn to meditate better. And he said, well, you need a mantra. 
Now, a mantra, they usually give you the name of a Hindu god, and you just keep repeating it over and over, thinking that you're clearing your mind and opening yourself up to ascended masters. But actually, you're opening yourself up to demons. But I began to, I said, well, what would I say? And he said, well, you could call on Buddha, you could call on Krishna, you could call on Jesus. He had them all at the same level. And I said, well, what should I say? And he said, well, just say, Jesus Christ, have mercy. And I would sit there in a yoga position, the whole thing, and just, just saying, Jesus Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, have mercy. And he did. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was calling on the living God, and I did not even realize it. Shortly after that, a friend of mine who had been very sick, he had had five serious heart attacks, and the last one had left him an invalid. For two years, he would crawl down the stairs in the morning. Nurses would come and wait on him. He would crawl back upstairs at night, and that was his life. And every once in a while, over this two-year period, he would call and he'd say, Donna, I just feel so bad. I just wish I could die, but I'm I have to be here for my kids. And... You know, so anyway, here I am saying, Jesus Christ, have mercy, thinking I'm opening myself up to uh, the universe and everything else, and Charlie called. And Charlie's actually an African-American man. He was in his mid-50s. He'd given me my first job in a restaurant, and I had no idea how significant that was going to be later in my life. But you know, as, um, as Charlie called, I heard his voice on the other end of the phone, and I said, he said, Donna. I said, Charlie? He said, Donna, I've been healed by the power of Jesus. And I thought, here's this Jesus again. It was like the Lord was totally surrounding me. Have you had the Lord do that for you in your life where he totally surrounds you? And, you know, I, but Charlie's voice was so different. I thought, I've got to go and find out what happened to Charlie. So I left Massachusetts. I went to New York. I knocked on Charlie's door. And when, when he opened the door, he was standing there completely healed completely healed. Hallelujah. Yes. And I'm looking at him thinking, Charlie, you've got to tell me what happened. And so we went into his kitchen. That was the gathering place in his home. And I said, Charlie, what happened to you? And he said that some friends from, um, had come to take him to a full gospel businessmen's meeting. Does anyone remember full gospel businessmen's? That was some years ago in the, what, 70s or something? When, um, when businessmen would gather before breakfast and the Holy Spirit was just poured out on these businessmen, miracles were happening. And so they took Charlie to a full gospel businessmen's meeting to be prayed for. His friends took him up to the front, and as they were standing in the line to be prayed for, the man went down the line and he just touched every person in the line. And as he touched Charlie, he just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. Charlie said it was like a bolt of lightning went right through him, knocked into the man standing next to him. That man was crippled up with rheumatoid arthritis, instantly healed, and Charlie was slain in the spirit. He was out for about 20 minutes, and he found out later nobody touched him. But he said it was as if hands just went in and pushed his enlarged heart right back down to normal size. And when he got up, he was totally healed. And he took off running after crawling for two years. Praise God. That's the God we serve. Jesus is our healer. That is the God we serve. And you know, sitting across the kitchen table from him, face to face, I knew that I was face to face with the miracle of God. And I said, Charlie, whatever it is that you have, that's what I want. And he said, it's Jesus. I followed Charlie in the sinner's prayer. I asked Jesus to come into my heart, to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from everything that I had done wrong. And I invited him in, and I gave my life away that, that day, just beautiful song, you know, just Jesus use me. And, and, you know, it was in those moments right there at his kitchen table. How many of you know that people can meet Jesus at a kitchen table? Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, right there at his kitchen table, I prayed the sinner's prayer. And then he said, Donna, have you ever heard of speaking in tongues? I said, no. He said, well, that's from God too. And I said, well, if it's from God, I want that too. And so he said, just raise your hands up and start praising God. 
And isn't it interesting, when we're serving Satan, we do all kinds of crazy things and don't even think about it, but somehow, sitting and raising my hands up, I thought, okay, um, right here at the kitchen table. But you know what? I think that's when I really surrendered my heart to Jesus because I said, Jesus, I don't even know if you're here and I don't know if you're real, but if you are and if you can use me, you can, I, I just want to give you with my life, if you can do anything with my life. And within minutes, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak a language fluently, and my first thought was unspiritual. I thought, I'm speaking a language fluently, and I never had to study it. It was wonderful. <laughs> I wish the other languages had come that fast. But you know, as I was, I just felt as, I, as the Holy Spirit was just filling me, I could see how turning away from him, from God had broken his heart, and I was just repenting and asking God to forgive me. And in those moments, I just knew that I was going to be serving God the rest of my life, that nothing else mattered. And I just felt that I was going to be a missionary. And so I can stand here today and tell you that our God is faithful. When he calls us, He is the one who brings it to pass. And I served for 13 years in South Asia as a single missionary, um, starting cafes for Muslim women, and then in Central Asia. And and then God had a wonderful surprise for me, Steve. (laughs) So God brought Steve and I together, and it's been an incredible journey. Yeah, it has. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, I was... um I, like I said, I lived here all my life, right in the center of the world. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, uh, I never really had much of an ambition to travel. I mean, I'd been to Canada once and stuff like that, but I was an engineer. You ever hear of Fermilab? It's this big laboratory out here. I was a lead engineer there for 30 years. And uh, my wife uh, for, of 30 years uh, passed away with cancer. And I just figured, well, that's a phase of life that's just over for me. And... But I had friends who were missionaries. We had helped to start an inner inner city church in Chicago, my wife and I. And the pastor had become a missionary and like four other families. And they came, uh, uh, to him and another family were just in town and we went out to eat. And they they said, well, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? And I said, I don't know, I I have resources and experience. I'd like to do something for for God. I thought I'd be an usher, I didn't know, I wouldn't do anything. But then they said, well, you know, you work for this prestigious place. We're over in, uh, in areas where there used to be the former Soviet Union, and they're looking for speakers over there uh, in the universities. What do you think about doing that so that we can get to know people? And my first thought was, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> I went back home, and I'm thinking, why on earth would I ever want to do this? But you know what? God worked on my heart. And he said, you know, you can do this. Are you going to do it or not? So I struggled with it for a few weeks. I really did. But I called and I said, okay, I'm in. And so I got to, I got to do this. And that's how I met Donna. And God just completely transformed my life. I mean, you know, the life that God had uh, planned is much better than the life I had planned. And, you know, I, I got to know Jesus in an even deeper way than I had never known him before. Because as you take a step with Jesus, he takes a step with you. And you get to see you have no friend in the world better than Jesus. And um, it's just wonderful. It's just absolutely wonderful. Steve, why don't you bring the word of God to us today? Okay. God's heart for all nations. Okay. Well, I have um, I have a, a tool that I teach around the world. Actually, it's in like in twelve languages. It's online, and if you go to Google and you just type in two thousand eight Bible brief, by the time you get to two thousand eight BIB, it should pop up as the first thing. It's in about twelve languages, and what it is, they're tools that will help you to go through the Bible very quickly to get a sense of the whole story of the Bible. And here's to kind of help you understand where this is coming from. Um, How many of us have ever heard the story in the Bible about the boy who killed a giant? Anybody here ever hear that? Okay, all right. Uh, How about the story about the guy who got swallowed by a fish? Do you ever hear about that? 
Oh, okay. Well, what's that got to do with Jesus? And that's the big question. Because there's a big story that all these stories are a part of. And that's what it helps us to see, that big story. And how that big story starts, it starts way back in the Garden of Eden. Back in Genesis chapter 3, God tells Satan, he says, I'm going to, you're going to, uh, to, to hurt the heel of the seed of the woman that I'm going to send against you, but he's going to crush your head. Well, what do you think Satan's thinking about this? Whoa, who is this person? I've got, I've got to get rid of him. And you know, a little later, Abraham, when, he, when God appears to Abraham, he gives him a promise. He says, Abraham, it's going to come through you. Through your descendants, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth. And so Satan, all of a sudden, he doesn't have to worry about all these other people. I just got to get, a, get this guy and his family. Now we go all the way. That's in the book of Genesis. We go all the way to the other end of the Bible. That's the book of Revelation. And if you go to chapter 7, what do you see? The Apostle John in chapter 4 is told, come up here through this doorway into heaven. So he goes up in the spirit, and he's before the throne room of God. And he's seeing all these incredible visions. And in chapter 7, it says, suddenly, a great crowd appeared, which no man could number, standing before the throne of God in heaven and saying, salvation we owe to the Lamb. And, and, and one of the, 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 uh, the, the creatures who was there, the heavenly creature, says to John, who are these? Well, John, you know, he lived, he, he knew Jesus. When he thought of church, he probably, it went just like when you're reading the New Testament, he's thinking of somebody's home, and probably, I don't know, maybe like this, you know? couple dozen people, maybe more. And here's a number, a crowd so big, no one can even number them. And he says, you tell me, who are these? And this, this person says to him, these are the ones who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And they have come out through great tribulation and are standing before the throne of God. Well, so there's the fulfillment but you notice he said they come through great tribulation. And right now, we're experiencing great tribulation, aren't we? It may not be as great as the greatest in the world, but still, it's still devastating in so many ways. But you know, there's a, such encouragement in the Bible. And I just want to share very briefly with you how this works. And if you look at that 2008 Bible brief, there's, there's different tools. There's like a slideshow and a magazine and a book. But there's this little video. And it's about 45 minutes. And it's, I don't know, it's half a dozen languages. But it'll take you through this story in the Bible very quickly. And um, you just click on everything's free. There's no charge for anything. But it'll show you as you're going through the Bible. Every book of the Bible will light up as you're going through it. And it'll tell you how the story fits together. But I just want to share a few highlights with you. So we talked about Abraham, and God told Abraham, it's going to be through your family, Abraham, that I'm going to do what I said in the Garden of Eden, and I'm going to bless every nation on earth. So Satan, his, his antennas are up. I've got to stop this. He knows his head's about to be crushed. So what does he do? Why, he gets the nation of Israel, the family of Abraham in Egypt, and he gets a, raises up a bad pharaoh and this pharaoh commits genocide he starts killing off all the babies he wants to destroy the family of abraham well how's that promise ever going to come true egypt the mightiest nation on earth at that time didn't matter to god jehovah's a great god isn't he he's he's not limited by what we think or what men think he raises up moses incredible 10 plagues, humbles the Egyptians, leaves their army at the bottom of the ocean, and brings his people into the promised land. But that's just the first phase. 
You know, when I was a kid, I used to, maybe you guys are young. I know I look very young too, but I'm not really quite that young. <laughs> but when I was a kid, I used to sit on Saturday mornings on the television, and I'd be watching cartoons. And I'd watch these corny shows like Flash Gordon and these kind of things. And you know how they always got you to come back the next week? You know, all of a sudden, oh, the heroes are driving off a cliff on the car. Tune in next week. and see. <laughs> So you tune in next week, and what is it? Oh, they're driving along in the car. You go, Phew, that was close. What? What do you mean that was close? <laughs> but, you know, in a way, those, that's what we call a cliffhanger, isn't it? That's kind of how the story of the Bible is. You know, we, we, we saw how, how God was, um, how they were in jeopardy in Egypt. But then when they got, to the, they got to the promised land, what happened is they weren't faithful to God, were they? They began to fight among themselves. They even wiped out the little tribe of Benjamin, practically. And, and all these terrible things, finally God said, okay, um, you can have a king. So he raises up. Finally, King David comes, to, and he, he unites the kingdom together. Um, and God tells David, he says, David, through your family, I'm going to bring a king who will reign forever, who will bless all the nations of the earth. Well, what do you think Satan's thinking? Oh, forget all these other guys. That's my target. I stop that. I'm, I'm clear. I'm free. And all, everything focuses on David's family. Well, when David dies, his son Solomon starts out really good but ends up bad. He, turn, he get, marries too many pagan women, what God warned him about, turned his heart away from God. And so what did he do? Uh, he, he does bad things, and God it, it split the kingdom in half. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel end up in the north in a kingdom called Israel, and only him and the tribe of Benjamin, his tribe of Judah and Benjamin, are in the south in a tribe called the tribe of Judah. God's going to work this all through Judah. He offers Israel that he'll bless them too if they stay faithful to him, but they don't. They start worshiping golden calves and all kind of crazy stuff. Not only that, they began to attack the southern kingdom. They themselves want to wipe out David's family. In fact, you know what happens? There's a good king in the Bible called uh, Jehoshaphat. You might have heard of him. And God uses Jehoshaphat in mighty ways, but he makes a big mistake. He becomes a politician. And what he does is he says, I'm going to take one of the daughters of the king of the north and make her, marry, him to, marry her to one of my sons, and maybe everything will be okay. Well, who was that king of the north? His name was Ahab. And who was his lovely wife? Jezebel. And that's the daughter that he took, the daughter of Jezebel. So what happened? Well, when Jehoshaphat died, his son took over, and then his son and the daughter of Jezebel, one of the granddaughters of Jezebel, by the name of Athaliah, was the queen. And what happened when her husband died, she took over that kingdom in the south. Do you know the first thing she did? She killed every man, woman, and child in King David's family. Every single one of them. Except for one tiny baby named Joash, who was hidden in the temple. Do you know how close it came to God's promise be not being fulfilled? But, you know, God is a great God. Man cannot stand against him. He turned it all around, and, they, and he restored the kingdom to King David's family. But even then, that northern tribe, there was this big empire in the, in the north called Assyria. And, he, and they said, you know what? We can't beat the southern kingdom, but we're going to invite you, Assyria. Why don't you come down? We'll give you gold and silver. Come down and wipe them out for us. Here they are. Here it is. Here's your payment. And the Assyrians said, well, thank you very much. We're going to come down and wipe you out first and take the rest of it, and then we'll get them. And that's what they did. They wiped out that northern kingdom. But when they camped around Jerusalem, there was a faithful king in Jerusalem at that time. His name was Hezekiah. There was a mighty prophet named Isaiah, 
Well, and Micah was another one at that time. And God gave Isaiah a word. Hezekiah, the, that king of Assyria, sent out this commander called the Rabshakeh. And he was out there, and he was taunting the Jews. Oh, you know, who's Jehovah? You know, he, we defeated all the nations. We're their gods. They're in the dust. What are you going to do? But God told him, I'm going to take care of this. You know, in one night, he sent one angel, one angel. And the Bible tells us he killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Now, that almost sounds too good to believe, doesn't it? But do you know, archaeologists today will tell you that Assyria never went westward again after that time. That not only that, we have in museums a, an inscription from that king, that Assyrian king who fought that battle and lost that army. His name is Sennacherib. And there he talks about his own version of what happened. But you know, as soon as he got back and wrote that, his own sons killed him. Not only that, it was one of the great mysteries of the whole ancient world, not just the Bible. The Greeks talked about it. They had a, 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 a historian named Herodotus. And he said, oh, I think, uh, I think maybe rats ate the bowstrings of the, of the Assyrian army. The Jews ran out and clubbed and, Oh, come on. And then there was another guy, uh, Bar Barossus. He was a, a, a historian of the, um, of the Babylonians. And he said, I think it was a plague. Yeah, a plague. In one night, a plague kills 185,000 soldiers? Boy, it makes COVID-19 look like a cold, doesn't it? <laughs> Come on! The truth is so much more believable, isn't it? Incredible and miraculous as it is. But you know, it wasn't just that. The Jews then became, they again, they fell away from God. And this time, God allowed them to be taken captive to Babylon. So how is God's promise going to come true? How is a king from King David's family ever going to rule all the nations of the earth? Well, you know that captivity came in three waves. The first wave, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came, and he took uh, Daniel and his three friends and brought them to Babylon along with the children of the really important people. And he figured, if I just take these people and take a lot of treasure, these people aren't going to mess with me. They'll do whatever I say. But what did God do? He raised up Daniel and his three companions. They became governors in Babylon through miracles, through visions, through the Spirit empowering them. And so they were ready to help the Jews when they would be taken captive. And the second wave, who did he bring? He brought Ezekiel, and he brought the king, a prince from King David's family named Jehoiachin. And this young prince was taken captive while his uncle, Zedekiah, remained the last king back in Jerusalem. In the third wave, they came and they destroyed everything. They took out all the people captive to Babylon. They destroyed the temple, destroyed the city. But look at what God already did. He took that one from King David's family, brought him to Babylon. Not only that, in the Bible, you'll read that Jehoiachin, when King Nebuchadnezzar died, he had a son named Evil Merodach. And Evil Merodach, God gave him favor in Evil Merodach's eyes. And Evil Merodach said, get him out of chains. Put royal robes on him. He's going to come and dine with me at my supper table. He's going to be here like one of my family. Now that sounds too good to be true too, doesn't it? It's almost like Cinderella, right? But you know what archaeologists found? Digging right outside the ruins of Babylon, the main gate in Iraq, right there in the dust was a clay tablet inscribed, and you know what was on it? It was the menu that they used to feed King Jehoiachin and his family every day. Right there. There it is. It is absolutely fact. This is our God. This is who Jesus is. So we see all these things. And, but even after that, the Babylonians were overcome by the Persians. But God, remember, he, God gave Daniel favor in the lion's den, and they got favor with the Persians. Then the Persians sent him back. 
and they built, rebuilt the temple, and things were looking good until they were unfaithful again, and the Romans conquered them. But then God gave a prophecy through Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, and he said, I am going to come myself to the temple, and I am going to cleanse it. And that's what we see. That was the introduction to the New Testament. Now, all these places we see in the Old Testament, it's important to realize this is Jesus. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. You know, no man has seen the Father at any time, but lots of people have seen God in Jesus. In fact, when you look at the tabernacle, it says God used to meet with Moses in the tent of meeting. His face used to shine. He had to put a veil on it. Who was he meeting? Even back in the Garden of Eden, it says, you know, God used to talk with Adam in the breezy part of the day. Who was he talking to? Who was he going for strolls with through the garden? It was Jesus. Jesus is God. And this is what all these people are missing. Your Muslims, your watchtower, your all these people. They don't see it. We know this is the Jesus who has caught our hearts, who we know, who's transformed the world. And so when Jesus came, it tells in Matthew, it says his name is Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. He is God with us. And Jesus himself is the one then who releases us from this sin. He is the one who defeats the devil, first of all, through defeating sin and death on the cross. I love that in, in, the, in the book of Corinthians. It says, if the rulers of this world, talking about you know, the devil and all his minions down here, really understood what they were doing, they would have never crucified Jesus. You know, they thought, they thought, oh, this was a happy day when they got Judas to go there and take that 30 pieces of silver. No, <laughs> because what it did is it turned everything upside down. Jesus conquered death. And through that, he offers eternal life. And the devil's, he says, I love that when he talks to his disciples, he says, I saw Satan falling as lightning from heaven. Satan's kingdom has been overturned. And we see, though, that the same problems have happened. There's tribulation. There always has been. What happened when the, the apostles, remember, they were first very scared. And they didn't want to go out. They were afraid to go out because, you know, they, they, all the Romans had oppressed them. Jesus had been crucified. But they were hearing reports of, well, here he is, here he is. And people are seeing him. And all of a sudden, he appears to all of them. In fact, at one time, he appeared to 500 of them at one time, it says in the book of Corinthians. And he says, and many of them are still alive here today. You go ask them. Don't just take my word for it. These were all eyewitnesses. They saw it. <coughs> and they weren't just hoping to see it. Look at Thomas. He wouldn't believe it even after everybody else saw it. He said, I can't believe this. Oh, and then Jesus said, really? <laughs> he said, my Lord and my God. He met him. That's our Jesus. That's who he is. And he meets each one of us today. So, but what did he tell them? He told the apostles, he said, well, he said, I, you know, the Great Commission, he said, I, I'm sending you forth to all nations uh, to make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. But he said, before you go, wait here in Jerusalem for power from on high. So we don't just grab somebody's satchel and go out door to door and pass out handbills. We wait for the Holy Spirit's power. We go out in prayer. We meet our friends. We meet, we meet our, our neighbors, our workmates, and others, and we pray about them. And we say, Lord, who should I talk to today? Open my lips that I can talk. Not my words, but give me words that, do you ever find this? Sometimes God will give you something to say, and it just, it's not a big deal to you, but that person might turn around and say, I can't believe you said that. That really spoke to me. And that's how God works. And that's our part today. 
There's, a, there's opposition. There really is. I mean, what ha- look what happened to the apostles and them. First, it, it was the high priests and them who tried to shut them up. They threw them in jail. And then that wasn't enough. They started pounding them from city to city and persecuting them. You know, one part, one part they got a city so riled up, they stoned Paul and he, they left them for dead. But, you know, I can't believe how the Holy Spirit works in Paul. You know, he goes through all these churches all the way through what's the country of Turkey now. And all he had to do was go a little further and be back where he started, which is where he wanted to go back, to the city of Antioch. But instead of doing that, he says, no, we're going to go back to every one of those churches again and, and come back around. He didn't care if he got stoned. He didn't care. He says, you know what? I love these brothers and sisters. I want to make sure they're okay. What a, that's what God does to us. It's not our courage. It's not Paul's courage. Each one of us, if all we have to do is say yes to Jesus and fall in love with him, let him, let him change our lives. And, and he'll do that. He, the Holy Spirit will move you in ways just so beautiful. I, I'm just so glad that he can use even me. I mean, I never thought, I, like I told you, I thought, well, my life was done. It wasn't. God is, God is faithful. But, you know, even with that, I mean, there were other governments. There were the Romans again. There were others who were persecuting. All through history, it's been a battle. Satan knows that, that his death sentence is there in the Bible. He has tried to wipe out the Bible. Wipe it out completely. You know, I, we study Islam, and, and to me it's kind of, it's kind of funny because Islam, Muslims will tell you, well, it's like, like they told Donna, Oh, I can't read your Bible. It's been changed. Really? Where has it been changed? Well, you know, we have thousands of documents, manuscripts, that go almost back to the time when it was written. We can show, no, it hasn't been changed. And Islam came 600 years after Christ. And you know in the Quran, it talks about the scriptures as being the word of God. Well, where's this idea that Muslims got that the Bible was changed? It came centuries later. When Christians began to point out to them, well, your own Quran says the Bible's authoritative. Here's what the Bible says. They all know it's been changed. Oh, really? (laughs) You know, the most amazing part is when we try to go back and find the early Qurans, you can't find a Quran even within 100 years of when Muhammad was supposed to, to to live. It doesn't exist. Isn't that amazing? What we're really seeing is a lot of these things happened later. So it's, a, it's an amazing time because a lot of these things are coming out to light. And we have to really realize the, the, the treasure we have here. And these, our dear Muslim friends, we need them to, to know the truth. They don't have to know all this stuff that we know about, about the foundations of Islam and that all they need to know is Jesus. There's even, uh, there's a, you guys might have heard of some of these terrorist organizations. There was one called Hamas. You might have heard of that in the news. It's pretty popular. And the son of the leader of Hamas, he became a Christian. Do you know what happened, how that happened? He got a hold of a Bible. And he opened up to the Sermon on the Mount. And when he read, Love Your Enemies, it absolutely changed his life. He was stunned. He says, what? He never heard of anything. Love your enemies? And he thought about it. And God's spirit flooded him. And you know, he went and he faced his family and told them, I'm a Christian. You know, when Muslims do that, their family doesn't say, oh, that's great, son. Be whatever you want to be. No, (laughs) that's not how it works. They pay a price. But you know what? Many of them are paying a price because they see it. Sometimes we're a little too close to it. And we begin to take for granted, oh, well, that's just the way life is. No, it's not. Life is hard and it's brutal and it's vicious. But Jesus is what makes the difference. And we are Jesus. We are his ears and eyes and lips. We are his heart. We are the ones, just like Impact Church, you are out here. You are spreading the kingdom of God. That is what the kingdom of God is. He rules in us, and through us, he touches the world. 
One day he will rule here firmly. And that's the day that Satan is dreading. And it almost seems like that may not be too far away, doesn't it? But you know what? We're here now. We have a tremendous blessing and privilege. Every single one of us. You know, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be anything. All you have to be is available. And God can use you. Sometimes it takes a lot of work. It, you know, even with Muslims, you'll, you'll reach a Muslim and it, there's a lot of issues you have to deal with because there's a lot of things you've got to help them to understand. But you know, it can be some of the most rewarding work too. Because when you see the Holy Spirit begin to transform people's lives, what an amazing thing that is. I don't think there's any other greater experience you can have outside of meeting Jesus yourself. And that's a privilege we all have. And so that's what that's the, that's the, we see in Revelation chapter 7. We see every nation, tribe, people, and tongue will one day stand before the throne and will proclaim salvation we owe to the Lamb who is seated on the throne. Our God, amen, amen. You know, we've all gone through this experience of COVID in this last year. And I don't know about you, but it seems like it's been like setting a reset button. Has it been like that in all of your lives as well? Just a slow down, a reevaluation, thinking about what is really important? What is the priority of my life? Where should I be putting my time and energy? And what should I be doing? And, you know, many of us have gone through tremendous loss this year. We know of people who've lost loved ones to COVID, not only COVID, but cancer and so many other things. Some people have lost jobs and income. And there have just been a lot of really, really challenging things this year. And, you know, sometimes it feels like we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But one of the things that is just so amazing is that the Lord promises that he will be with us even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you know, even as he, as um, after the resurrection, when Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Our Lord has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he is sending us, his church, out. And he said, go. Go and make disciples of all nations. And we see in, in this word that God's promise has always been for all nations. God loves every single person. And he is bringing all nations right around us right now, isn't he? I'm sure that we have people living from many different nations in our neighborhood. And God loves people. He wants them to know Jesus. And so he's bringing about these, these changes so that we can even be missionaries in our own neighborhoods, crossing cultures, crossing language barriers, crossing religious barriers to bring the good news of the gospel so that we can help people to, um, well, first of all, it says we are to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them whatsoever I have commanded. And you know, the thing that kept me on the field for so many years was this one promise from the Lord, because he says to go, but then he said, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. So we're not going on our own, on, in our own strength, in our own power, in our own anything. We are going at the, at the command of the Lord. And so I would just like us to pause for a few minutes now. And it could be that the Lord has been speaking to you this year about changes, about something new that he wants you to do, some new direction. Maybe, uh, maybe it's in prayer. Maybe it's going to our neighbors. Maybe it's just in different ways reaching out to people. That's the heart of our Lord, isn't it? He loves people. He loves people. And he says that people will know we are Christians by our love one for another. And so as God changes our hearts, he gives us a heart of love for other people. So let's pause in his presence for just a few minutes and let's just ask the Lord 
to really clarify for us the things that he's speaking to each one of our hearts. Maybe like Steve, he's speaking to you at this age of maybe taking a new step of faith, maybe doing something that you have never done before, but he's putting it on your heart to do. And you know, we can always make excuses. Oh, I'm too old, or I'm too young, or, you know, I don't know the Bible well enough. Well, you know what? We're never going to know the Bible um, completely, but Jesus, the living word, is living in us. And so as he sends us forward, he's, he is going with us in the, in the power of the living word. And maybe he's speaking to us about getting more involved in church, maybe teaching a Sunday school class, maybe being involved in a different ministry that's, that's starting. But God is calling each one of us to be obedient and to be faithful. It was when the people of God were disobedient and unfaithful that things began to fall apart. But as soon as their eyes and attention turned back to the Lord, he began to use them again. And that's what we want. We want to be used by, by the Lord for his glory and for his honor. One day we're going to be joining those great, that great cloud of all people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. And we want to all be around the throne, experiencing the most awesome party that we will ever go to, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Can you imagine? That's going to be amazing. <laughs> but let's just, let's just pause in prayer for a minute. Lord, I just ask that you would speak to each one of our hearts today. You know where we live. You know where we are. You know the things that we're facing. You know the things that we have faced this past year during the pandemic, and even now, there are still effects of that, Lord, and um, you know where we are. You know the cry of our hearts, Lord. You know the cry of our hearts. You know the things that are difficult for us. You know the things that look really hopeless and look like there is not an answer to it. But Lord, as we come to you today and bow in your presence, in your presence, Lord, the presence of the Most High God, we acknowledge that with you all things are possible. And so, Lord, we just want to cry out to you. If we have never given our hearts to you, Lord, if we have never said, Jesus, I want you to come and to be my Lord and Savior. If we have never called out to, on your name and surrendered our life to you and asked you to forgive our sins, help us to do that today, Lord. Help us to do that today. You conquered sin and death. And as we come to you and ask that you would forgive us and cleanse us, and as we begin to walk in obedience with you, you give us a new heart. You change us from the inside. And Lord, we want to do that today. Why don't we just pray this prayer together? Uh, just repeat this prayer after me. It's not the words that save us, but it's when we cry out to Jesus from our heart and when we want to come to him. So, Lord Jesus, we come before you today. We know that we are sinners. We know that we are sinners. We have sinned and done things that have hurt your heart. We have sinned and done things that have hurt your heart. But we thank you that you have given us the solution for that. We thank you that you have given us the solution for that. Because you died on the cross to take away my sins. And I want to ask you to take away my sins today. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. And the resurrection shows that your promises are true. And the resurrection shows that your promises are true. So I want to put my trust in you today, Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to put my trust in you today, Lord Jesus Christ. I give you my life. And I ask that you would come into my heart. I ask that you would come into my heart. 
that you would cleanse me and that you would use me for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And there may be some of you today who have just really been struggling with anxiety or depression or fear or hopelessness. But today, Lord, we just pray right now in your precious holy name that fear would be broken in Jesus' name, that you would lift depression and despair and hopelessness, that you would fill us with your hope, Lord God, that you would fill us with courage, that you would fill us with your spirit, and that you would help us to know that you will never leave us or forsake us, that we are not alone. And Lord, they may, there may be some here that you are calling to go and share your gospel in other lands. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us all to say yes to your plan and your purposes in our lives. Lord, we want to say yes to you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. God bless you. <laughs> Please remember to take one of everything. It's all there and it's all free. Hey, Y'all give him a hand clap. I don't know about y'all, but as I was listening to Steve, he took us from Genesis all the way through to Revelations. So if y'all didn't get nothing out of it, y'all must have fell asleep on it. But there's one thing that Steve and Donna didn't mention. They also have a newsletter that they send out. And there's a card over there that you can fill out and you can receive the newsletter. How often is that, Steve? Every three months you receive the newsletter. Amen. Did y'all y'all get a good word today? I don't I don't know if y'all didn't. I I know I did. I got fed today. Amen. So as always, we thank you for coming out. We thank you for being here and enjoying uh, joining us in the service. So as our pastor always says, remember to what? Be a blessing. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. And we'll see you on next Wednesday. Is it Wednesday or Sunday? Sunday. We'll see you next Sunday.